Alright, so we are at Parashat Vaikra, and uh, welcome all to this uh, segment of our Parashat Shavua. So after we had the previous two books of Sefer Bereshit, with, its, uh, with the stories of creation, and uh, the, the stories of the, of, the, of the Avot, the Patriarchs, we had Sefer Shmot with the stories of Yetziat Mitzrayim, Matan Torah, with you know, those big attractions, those interesting, big production and everything, you know, epic stories of Am Yisrael. All of a sudden, come lands upon us Sefer Vaikra. I mean, Kaka, out of nowhere, it comes Sefer Vaikra. And it starts with Korbanot, the whole entire book. It's called Sefer, how does Sefer Vaikra called? Torah Kohanim, it's all about Korbanot, Korbanot, Korbanot. And it might seem that it gets a little boring after a while. Especially after the big attraction that we had with the other books. And, you know, do we, sometimes you get the question, it's like, you know, like, you have a party that you're going into a new, let's say, a new school, a new class, they, the first day they make you a party and, you know, make it welcoming to you, and then the second day comes, and it's, okay, now what? So it's kind of intimidating. All of a sudden, it seems boring. Well, now we have to be a nation. That's what a nation is all about. I thought it's going to be like uh, amusement parks all, all throughout the history. So it looks a little bit, uh, a little bit boring. It looks, uh, the action of the Korbanot seems also a little bit difficult to connect to. A lot of numerous details about which korban, which chet, which avera, how to do it, where to do it. It might seem, as we said before, maybe even boring, and maybe even uh, it's not so humane to do that. Peter, by all means, does not like korbanot, because they can shech them, and, you know, the European unions and so on, without a doubt, probably that's why they don't want the metal mikdash, because we have to do korbanot. You know, we're shechting animals, really, honestly. What do I have to do with this? It's not 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 my uh, not my cup of tea. We don't really need korbanot today. We have tefillah. We all know. parim sefatenu, and we will play with bulls with our lips. But you know, what do we really need that, right? And even today, there some people say that uh, we don't really need korbanot altogether. Even beta mikdash. What do you need beta mikdash for? Many times I heard this. For what to bring korbanot? This is kind of primitive. It's even Pagan, you know, kind of practice. Do we? We don't really need that. So the question: Do we really need it? It's interesting that the Gemara in Masechet Sanhedrin brings that when Ole Bavel came with Ezra and and Nehemiah about five hundred years after the whole destruction and you know the, the whole the whole story there when they came back, uh, they cried and they said that. The main reason why we left this country was because of what? I'm sorry, five hundred years before, before, or before the count, before the Sri right? Why do we? Why do we read it? Because of that, Beit Hamikdash was destroyed. Because of the Yetzerara, right? We 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 went to exile. All the troubles came to us because of Yetzerara. You gave it to us for to get a reward. So he gave us Yitzhara to get a reward. You know what? We don't want it, and we don't want its reward. We don't want it. We don't need this. There was at a time in, in Am Yisrael, there was a tremendous urge to do Avodah Zarah, idol worshipping. And some hold that the, that the whole Shechita, the, the thing was, you know, uh, to remove the desire of idol worshipping from their hearts by shechting the animals in a way like when you ask an idol worshipper to break his idol to be mevatel that so in a way you shecht it you, you know you can worship something that you killed and 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 uh, the Gemara says further that Kadosh Baruch Hu took a lion cub out of the Holy of Holies and from then on, there's no more 
desire for idol worshipping in the war in the world. Again, of course, maybe besides a uh, little minor idol worshipping of some celebrities and reality heroes, etc., etc. But uh, overall, we don't have such a desire. And again, this is according to the Rambam, the main reason for the Korbanot, machloket between the Rambam and the Ramban, regarding what the Korbanot are all about. The Rambam says it was just to remove in Moren Nebuchim. He said it was really to remove from the heart the desire to worship, especially goats and other type of animals in which the people of the era did. So according to this, based on that, some people take it out of contact and say, Ma, we don't need this anymore, we don't have this desire. The Ramban says, no, you, you don't understand what the Korbanot are all about. So let's try to go with that trend. So that's a good explanation of so that trend. Ramban. Because, yes, because, I mean, Ramban. So afterwards, I mean, if you come to think about it, <coughs> For whatever reason, we keep, if it's not applicable, we keep on reading every year, Sefer Vaikat. There's no sign, okay, guys, if this is not applicable, let's just skip that. You know, it's a part of the, of the daily thing we do. And apparently, you know, it's very important for us to do. And we never said that in Beit HaMikdash is going to be built, there's not going to be any more Korbanot. Okay, so what do we do in the time being until we have Beit HaMikdash? It does, it, does it make any difference to me? What does it do to me on a personal level? So we have to understand, and now we're going to go a little bit into the more mystical part of the Korbanot. We, again, we know that every, every mitzvah and everything that is in the Torah has a tzad pinimi and a tzad chitzoni, an internal side to it, which is the mystical side, and an external, you know, what we understand by logic, you know, so everything like this. So we need to understand that we do or renew all the time uh, vessels for the abundance that comes from above. In order for the abundance to come, we need a vessel. For example, let's say I'm thirsty and I have this cup here of whatever liquid it is. What is this? Ginger. Ginger. So... I'm very thirsty, and the ginger ale is very tempting, and it's sweet, and it's bubbly, and it's cold, and the only reason I will be able to enjoy it is because I have a vessel to actually hold it. If there's no vessel, it just doesn't fall into my mouth. I need something to hold this in. So into that uh, concept, the abundance, the shefa is the ginger ale, and we are the vessels, or we make vessels in this world to hold it. So therefore, many times when we do an Avera, we do a Chet, we make holes, we blemish those vessels and they're not able to hold the Bracha, the, the blessing, the wealth. So we need to fix them. We need to fix those blemishes. When those blemishes are fixed, only then the water of abundance, it's again, it's a, it's a spiritual metaphor, the water of abundance, that flow of abundance is able to come down. When there is a hole, it doesn't come because you don't want to waste it. It just stays there, freezes up in the air like this. If you want to think, you know, which is interesting, I saw, I still think I sent it to you, that clip of the, uh, of the, the water. Of the water with the, with the, with the, with the frequencies. It's amazing. So it's kind of, there's a, that, sin that we do breaks the frequency of the water that is suspended up in the air until we fix it and then it comes down. Basically something that if you saw it you understand. So and that Shefa, the divine abundance that comes from above comes in and fills those vessels and that is called, that action of fixing it and allow the thing is called Yehudim. Yehudim is to put things together. But what am I actually putting here together? That you could be seen, could be seen in Avodata Korban by by the the whole process of bringing a Korban, and for now, just for now, we'll use that word Korban as sacrifice, and you'll see that it does not really mean a uh, a sacrifice that you bring, you know, like for God. It's not in English. The English language does or does wrong to the whole concept of Korban, and along the line we get mistaken by that. We'll get to it soon, Bezot Hashem. When the Korban goes up, the Shefa goes down. This way. It needs to go up, and then it brings it down. 
in order to understand a, a phenomena in creation, the same thing is, by the way, as we spoke about letters. Remember, we said, if you, under, if you want to understand the meaning of a letter in Hebrew, you need to find the first time it appears in the Torah, and then you connect to it. For example, the word Beit of Bereshit comes in the beginning. Beit, you write Bet, Yud, Taf. It represents a bite. It represents Bria. Like the letter Bet should be like the home. Close it from all the sides and open inside. The word Aleph of Elohim refers to El, Le Aleph, to train. It opens from above, opens from the bottom, and so on and so forth. Gimel, right? Gimel represents many things. One of the things it represents, it does look like a Gamal, but represents also a Gibo, right? Exactly it. A person, how is a Gibo? He has to have two feet standing on the ground. His head bent down, you have to be humble to be a hero. And on and on and on. So you have to look at the first time the letter appears in the Torah to understand the true meaning of the letter. And then as the word appears. The same thing here. The first time we have a phenomenon, we don't want to know what about it, what's going on about it. We need to look at the first time it appears in the Torah. And what is the root of this avodah, this phenomena? So Parashat Bereshi, Parashat Vayikra, I'm sorry, opens with the word, Adam ki akriv mikem korban. And a person is going to bring a sacrifice from among you. The word Adam comes to remind us something. Comes to remind us that uh, the, the, the first person, first human being to bring a korban, to bring a sacrifice to God, was Adam Arishon, first man, Adam, after he sinned in Etz Adat, with the tree of knowledge. And it says in the Midrash, Shaul, the bull that Adam Rishon brought, was a unicorn. He had like a single horn. At <clears throat> Adam Rishon, Hashem, first man, Hashem put in Gan Eden. And it says in the Torah, Vayatsev Hashem Elohim, Al Adam Lemor. Behold, it's Hagar. He commanded him from all the trees of the of the garden you, you can eat besides that one. Achol tochal, you should eat. Ume etz adat, and from that knowledge, uh, the, the tree of knowledge, tov vera, that there is a bad side to it and a good side to it. Lo tochal mimenu, you should not eat from it. Why? Ki beyom achlecha mimenu motamut, and the day that you're going to eat it, you're going to die. So it's going to die. That's how we're going to we translate it in English. You're going to die. In Hebrew, it says mot tamut, mot tamut. What does it mean, mot tamut? You die, you'll die. So Chazal says mot tamut, tamut ba'olam azay you'll die in this world, tamut ba'olam abay you'll die in the next world as well. So when Adam Arishon lived in Gal Eden, he lived in two worlds in the same time. He lived in this world and that world together, the same time, simultaneously. In other words, Adam Arishon included all reality in him, both spiritual and physical reality in him. Everything was in him, and so are we. It says in the books of, uh, in many Kabbalah books, Zohar, and some other books, that the six days of creation are Beru. Beru means sifting, sorting. And these are Yemei Havdalah, the days of separation, right? Havdalah Barakia. Havdalah, Lavdir, Havdalah, Ben Maim Lemaim. It says, separate between this and that. Ben Maim Lemaim. Ben Or. Vachoshech, every single thing is a havdalah, separating, designate, distinguish between light and darkness, day and night, water and water, <coughs> between good and bad. And if we continue with this path and this pattern alone, according to the Pshat Advarim, the simple understanding of this thing, it means that there is only one part of creation that is needed and is wanted. The other one is, in a way, rubbish, right? We don't need it. It's not necessary. In other words, 
Only the light is needed. Darkness is not needed. Only good is needed. And I'm, t- I'm telling you that. Only good is needed. Bad is not needed. Really? Bad is not needed? Only day is needed. Night is not needed. And so on is, is everything else in creation, right? So how is it possible, if you come to think about it, how is it possible? The Akadosh Baruch Hu himself, right? King of all kings. The one and only Akadosh Baruch Hu created a world that half of it is unnecessary. It's impossible. It's impossible. Since it's impossible, we need to understand it appropriately. Because that's what we do. It says, okay, if this is this, this I don't need, throw it away. But that's, that's not, that's, that doesn't work like this. You never get anything. That's why Kadosh Baruch Hu created on the sixth day, He created man, created mankind. Mankind is the center of creation. Is the most superior of all creatures in the world. There's no other creature with sense of ingenuity and experimentation as human. No animal experiments. The lions hunt the same way as the lion hunted when they were created. Did you ever think about, for example, arguments? It's just something to get a little sidetracked. Why is this fascination that we have of drinking, for example, tea? We enjoy sipping tea. Who was the first one to drink tea? Well, you could say probably some pine needles fell into a pot that the person was boiling. Why was he boiling it for? Where did he get the pot? Apparently he experimented. And that's what we do. We experiment all the time. There's no other creature that does it. Mankind is the center of creation. Sometimes we, we divert from our job, but we have a, a great job ahead of us, and I'll explain to you why. At the job title of mankind, uh, there is completion, shlemut, wholeness to it. Why? Because man holds within itself everything, good and bad. And what I'm telling you is very, might be very difficult for you to understand. But just stay with me. We all have good and bad inside of us. Elyonim, upper, and Tachtonim, lower. We have darkness and we have light in us. We have Gan Eden and we have Geenom. Eretz Israel and Chutz La'aretz. Everything that there is in the world could, is, does exist, should I say, actually exists in the human body. And every limb of the human body represents a part of the general creation. For example, in Kabbalah we have the four, four worlds. Atzilut, Bria, Yetzira, and Asiya. So for example, for Atzilut, right? We have chest up, Bria, chest down, and so on and so forth. Yetzirah, Asiyah, different parts of the body represent that. Every limb of our body has something in it that includes all realities inside of it together. Again, all reality includes in one individual person. Now you might understand when we say when you save a person, you save a whole entire world. You save a universe. We are a universe. Humankind is a very important thing. And that's why it says, B'Tselem Elohim, in the image of God, He created Him. That's what it means, B'Tselem Elohim. In other words, that the intention is that, in the, that you could see God, right, in mankind. The physiological reality of man shows us, for example, that everything is important. And everything has its own job, its own duty. Our job divides sometimes, or splits sometimes, in specific places. And everything that is negative, if it's negative, 
And this is a very important thing to remember. If something is negative, a person, an idea, whatever it is, it's a big concept to understand. If something is negative, is only negative because he is or it is present in the wrong place at the wrong time. That's why it is important to move on in life. For example, you have a job, you are the right man, the right person at the right time. You need to move on because eventually you will be the wrong person at the wrong time. That's how you become negative. You were good to do something. You started something. If it wasn't for you, you're right. It would not have started. It would not come up to what it is. But it's time for you to pack up and move. Because when you fail to do that, you become negative. And when you become negative, you become destructive. Don't ever stay in one place. Learn it. That's why we never stay young forever. We, need, we, we grow older. We change all the time. You don't need to go so far and open so many books to understand it. All you got to see is what's happening to you. You have to be in touch with it. So in a way, the fact that you're getting old with time, it's a good thing. Imagine you'll be 200 years old and you act like a 10 year old. It's a catastrophe. We'll destroy the world. So something that is negative means it's in the wrong place at the wrong time. And if it's not going to do that, and if we'll be able to understand that, we can fix whatever is wrong, we can make it tikkun gadol, we can fix it. Men must work and to achieve and to strive that all his parts within him would be directed to worship Hashem, to do avodat Hashem. Don't walk around, you know. Walk around. In other words, that every part of him, all his limbs will be partners in that. In our generation, we talk many times about communication and talking, and we open channels of communication, and so on and so forth. There is no better ways of communication or given an example of how things should be than in the human body. What do I mean? There are limbs of, of our body that by their own nature are oppositional for, for, to each other. For example, you have your lungs that bring in a way to cool the body. How? They bring the air in, they cool the body. You have the heart. That what, what does the heart do? Besides pumping the blood. Warms the body. Right? So the lungs and the, and the heart are oppositional to each other. And so on and so forth. Every single thing in the body. And yet, right? And yet they're in complete harmony. Our whole entire body is, the whole harmony of our body is built on the opposites, on harmony. It's not built on one thing. You know, I'm only going to have cooling effects in our body. Then I'm going to be a lizard. I'm going to be human. It's all about those opposites. And that's how we have this. And how do we have it? Through tremendous discipline of the body that everything has to function. And it has to function right. So if you want to build a functioning society that is harmonious society, it's not that you need to have everybody like you. That everybody should have the same mindset, the same clothing, color, skin, and so on and so forth. That's not a healthy society. That's an off-balance society. When I wanted to move back to Israel, I wanted to say, I only want to move to, uh, let's say, a very religious uh, you know, city or neighborhood or whatever it is. But I realized that I'm going to be taking away from my children a great experience in life. I end up not moving there. But that's for different reasons. So therefore I start looking for the most homogeneous community. When everybody's going to be from all sides. The most harmonious community. Because they need to know how to interact. And I need everybody in that. 
I don't want everybody like me. It will be boring. There's no harmony in that. And that's why we are all different. HaKadosh Baruch Hu created each and every one of us as a tremendous individual. It's all about being different. So when our body, for example, uh, is like that, it's through the discipline that we have to do one thing, we have to function. But if you, you cannot put, for example, order by being a tyrant or, or being a dictator. Order comes through tremendous love, great love, unlimited amount of love. Love, remember, I keep telling you this over and over again, love means oneness. Not being identical, being one for the mission. The great love. HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave us Torah. And by the, if you follow the ways of the Torah, you could turn everything that is so-called bad into good. When you have Torah in your life, even your bad part becomes light. That's why Kadosh Baruch Hu created man at the end of creation. After he separated all the separations, put man in the middle in order for mankind to do, to be a partner in creation and to bring back everything together, le'achdut, to unity, v'shlemut, wholeness. Our job is to bring everything back together. This is how we become partners in creation. So therefore, how do we do that? I have to turn the page. And this is what it means that Adam Arishol lived in two words, worlds at the same time. His body could connect with his neshama, with his soul, in the most absolute way. We don't. We have a disconnect. As much as there is a cognitive dissidence, we have spiritual dissidence. As much as HaKadosh Baruch Hu makes this magic thing of connecting the body with the soul, the connection is not complete. The complete connection is when both of them operate on one wave, on a single wave. Both of them want to do Retzon Haboe, the will of God. So your soul wants to do it and your body needs to do it too. Both of them need to realize that this is our job. Zoa Voda Shelanu. This is our job. To do Ritzona Boy. Not when your body does something that your Neshama knows that it's wrong. Etzada Tovera, that tree of, of knowledge, good and bad, is the tree that confuses, mebalbel, confuses, that shows us that what? That there is only bad in the world. If mankind, the first man, I'm sorry, first man would not, wouldn't have eaten from it, he would have continued seeing that the world is all good. Remember, Rabbi Akiva, Gamzula Torah. And remember, Rabbi Nachum Gamzu, his Rebbe, called the Avid Rachamana the Tavavid. Whatever HaKadosh Baruch Hu does is for the best. I know it. I don't have... Uh, I don't have a, I know it, I know that this is good, I see the good in everything. It's a trem- look at the level that these people were able to reach. You can do it also. You can do it also. So, even though it's a dot, the tree of knowledge creates tremendous damage to mankind, that he fell into this reality of confusion between good and bad, from the tachlit, from the purpose, that was a great thing for mankind. Why? Because everything that we need to do in this world is avodah v'yegi'ah. You need to work for something. Nothing comes without you doing an effort. And you need to work hard on it, yegi'ah. Because before that, Adam Arishon got everything by Avodah. He had to work for it, but not hard. Everything was a gift. Everything was a gift given for Shamayim. 
Now we have to work hard on it. And this is, our, this is how we're able to get the reward. So there are two forces that works in our reality. There is a resisting force, and there is an attraction force. Koach Meshicha, gravity, right? And then on the pulls us away. And we should, for a second, kind of break away from the predetermined knowledge that we have, notions that we have about those two forces. And we need to realize that the materialistic reality is that the world is balanced. In other words, when you have the, when everything is in equilibrium, when, the, when gravity is equal to the, to the breaking force, there, so therefore it's, it's, that's what we are, right? That's what we don't snap out and or we don't just keep on going down into the earth, right? It's equal. If that wasn't the case, we would not be able to live. Your life, your ability to live fulfilled life will be determined on that balance that you have in your heart, in your in your in yourself, between your will, and we all have it, to connect to God as hard as we can and to break away from it. Because if one will be greater than the other, either you just die out of this world or you're going to lose this world. We need to put everything into a harmony. Etzadah Tovera created confusion in us and lack of clarity in Ruchmiut, materialistic, and, I mean, spiritual and Gashmiut, materialistic matters. And that's what Chazal says that after Adam Arishon sinned, he lost this world and that world. And this is the reason why we sometimes and many times feel not connected. We, f- we don't feel we belong to anything. We don't belong to this world. We don't belong to that world. We're being grinded by gravity and by our, our need to, to, to shoot up so-called. How do we do that? How do we fix this? How we bring things back into balance is very simple. You have to go back to basics. I told you many times when you're having confusion, go back to basics. Go back to what you know. Go back to what you know to do mechanically but with, without thinking about it. What is not your second nature? What is your nature? Go back to basic. You get confused. You get, need to get back to the rhythm that you have. The rhythm of your inner rhythm that you know you have it all the time. Your heartbeat. That's why before people go to war in ancient times, they used to play the drums. You're going to war, your heartbeat goes like this. The, heart, the, the drum always imitates the heartbeat. Go back, it's okay. Let's go back into rhythm, slowly, slowly. So we need to go back to the base, to the root of things. We need to go to the, to the body that happened to us before the sin, before the chet. That could be done only by the power of the korban. The korban and the atonement is to go back to your roots. Of course, you need to fix those roots. This is the Korban that Adam Arishon, first man, understood that he needs to bring. And how did he know how to do that? Don't forget, Adam Arishon was the work of God. So regardless of his, uh, his blurry vision that he had, he knew that by divine inspiration that that's what he needs to do as soon as he wanted to make tshuva, he understood that he needs to bring korban. And that he needs to put everything back together. And this is the remez that Chazal says, that the horn of the bull that Adam Rishon had, it was a single horn one. It was right in the middle. It was a single horn bull. Why? For one mission, to connect them all together. Adam Rishon was the first one to understand that he blemished and affected that vessels. He, he, he affected the process of elevation of, or the connection between the worlds. And he needed to connect them both together. And that's why Chazal said when they built the Mishkan, remember we learned the Zohar, he said when they built the Mishkan here, immediately a Mishkan in Shamayim was built and when they would bring the Korban, it would be connected together. Through the Mishkan, through building the Mishkan, when they inaugurated the Mishkan, the Mishkan in Shammai was up through the Korbanot. 
not the smoke, because the smoke is physical, but through the action of the Korban, whatever comes behind it, which you're going to see now, that was the connection. In other words, there was the, both receivers, one was receiving, it's like a radio. The wave was, that connects them with the Korban. The two radios, the walkie-talkie that we have. We had one walkie-talkie here, they had another walkie-talkie in Shammai. Then you need the battery to set the waves on the frequency, that's the Korban. And this is what Korban means, to pay attention now. Korban means that there's not going to be any difference between the worlds. Adam HaRishon, he entered Gan Eden to live in both worlds. And he cut, he made a cut. So he wasn't able to connect to the upper worlds. There was a resistance. And his words collided, his point of view collided. So when you see people that come out of faith, that leave Judaism, is because they had prior to that a spiritual cut. And the words collided, there, were disharm- there was a disharmony in them. And they need to bring back this harmony that they have. They have to go back to basic. Otherwise they will be snapped out and will chase them the rest of their lives. Korbanot, the main purpose of Korban is to come closer to God. When there is a disconnect, you need to come closer. That's why it's called Korban, Milashon Karov. Korban means to come close. Korban does not mean to sacrifice. I don't sacrifice anything when I bring a lamb. Or when I do what I do. It's to the, the desire that I have to come closer. And therefore, the question is, how could we do it that we don't have Beit HaMikdash to do so? How could we substitute the Korbanot? Well, one way is tefillah. One way to do that is tefillah. To bring a korban, the meaning of that is to expose, we're about to finish, is to expose the inner light that each and every one of us has inside. Then what we do, we, you know, we need to bring a korban. So what do we do? We're going to call the, we're going to go to Aaron's Casino, we're going to go to A to Z, uh, please I need an order, give me two uh, lamb chops, two ribs, uh, and so on and so forth. What are we going to do, Michael? We're going to fall asleep, Michael? So what are we going to do? So the first thing to do when we bring a korban is to bring the behemah, to bring the beast. <laughs> it doesn't only mean the physical beast. It means the beast in you. That's why you put your hands on it. You need to feel the beast in you. The beast in us that is obsessed and addicted for to money, honor, to all the things that we are we are addicted to. And in order to bring the behemoth, to bring the beast, we need to know exactly its nature. Who is this beast? This is the first stage. Sometimes we, we get addicted to something and we, and we think that we, through process we get rid of it. And then uh, all of a sudden, you know, Shalom Aleichem, how are you? I'm back. The habit is back. I thought I stopped smoking. Before you know, boom, I'm smoking again. I thought I am addicted to this. Boom, all of a sudden I find myself again. And then we get scared. And then we give up. Oh, I can't do this. I'm, I'm a loser. It's not, I can never do this. You know what? Bring on the whiskey. Bring on the smoke. Bring on whatever else I'm addicted to. I, I can't do this. You can't do it because you don't know how to do it. And let me try to show you how. First of all, there's no way to, there's no place to get panic, to get scared, to, to, to do any of these things. There's nothing to get scared about. Why? Because, why we get scared? Because for us, Chazal says that It's a metaphor. Light and darkness are all mixed up together. So we need to understand that this is a part of us. That bed, as we said before, is a part of us. And we need to concentrate in what we need to concentrate. And we need to remember that either 
I would control it or it would control me. I'm not going to be able to kill it. I need to control it. And just the same thing as we said in the body. The body stops functioning when things go out of control. When I'm controlling everything for a purpose, everything works and fine. This is how we are. This is the body, that's the way it is. It's not that there's no more, by the way, it's not we start with the Yetzirah of Avodah Zarah. It's not that there's no more Yetzirah of Avodah Zarah. But it, it went to certain, certain mutation. It, it changed a little bit. It exists in a different matter. I mean, truthfully, Paro thought he was God. He idolized himself. He was in love with himself. To the point that he became Avodah Zarah himself. He became the idol. His mindset is not so far away from, so far off from what many of us experience today or we were witness to, this idolization of the self, of the I, that I am becoming more important than anything else, even greater than God himself to do what I want. This is a form of Avodah Zarah, so it's still with us. But it just changed a little bit. We call it different things. We call it groupies today instead of idol worshippers. We call it follow me, you know, one of those uh, you know, followers, you know, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> so, that's why in the action of the Korbanot, there is, it's quite, it's quite practical uh, and it's quite actual to what we do here today, even though physically I cannot do the Korbanot, but it has many layers in it. For example, if we're talking about Korban Oleve Yored, Korban Oleve Yored is not a, a sacrifice you put in an elevator and goes up, up and down, up and down, Oleve Yored, Oleve Yored. So it's not an elevator Korban. So let's say, for example, Korban Oleve Yored is, uh, or, or it's not angels in a, in a ladder, you know, like they're going up, Tulam Yaakov, Olim Veyodim. That's none of the above. Uh, let's say, for example, a person made a chet. He swore Shavuot Shaker. He, he made a false, uh, he swore in vain. So he needs to bring a korban. The korban is a kifsa, a lamb. What can we do? But right now he doesn't have any money. He doesn't have the money to bring the korban. So okay, to bring, bring two birds to bring a korban instead of that. He doesn't have money for that either. It's not a problem. Same tavi solet, farina. Measurement of, of farina mixed with oil, semen, solid mincha, berula, bashemen, right? And uh, I mean, if you think about it, uh, it's a tremendous deal. It's very, uh, you know, it's, uh, how should I say it? It doesn't get better than that in terms of that. It's, it's cheap, it's a tremendous sale. Just as good. In other words, so what do you learn from? You learn from here that you, and this is something specially for you. You can't measure and judge anyone or anything other than how he is or it is right now in front of you. So, therefore, the Torah is a tremendous, is a tremendous uh, uh, understanding of socially of. of the needs of a person. Look at a person how he is right now. Yesh lo he has money. Tavi, tavi korban. I'll make a big barbecue. Tavi korban. You don't have smaller. You don't have this. A seritaifa. A little bit. Tavi mashu katanchik. Something according to your abilities. Your kuchimoni writes, and Midrash of kuchimoni writes, it says like this, and I'm quoting. Rabbi Yehuda said, Yafa mitzvah beshata. Mitzvah on its time, it's beautiful. The nice, the best way to do mitzvah is on its time. Don't postpone it. Don't procrastinate. Do it on its time. In other words, right now you have money for right now you have money for uh, aserita ifa for solid for farina. Good, bring it now. This is as good as you brought a lamb, the superior marino lamb. Super kosher, beautiful fat, and, and, and it is this is just as good as that. Why? Because we don't look at, at the size, we look at it now. This is just as good as this. We don't say, you know what, wait a minute. 
Right now you don't have it. Next week you're going to get a paycheck. Next week, Tavilano, bring us a big kebab. Now say, shish kebab, gadol. Bring a bit. No, no, no. We're not going to wait for you to get rich. Right now, this way you can do it. That's what you're going to do. Which is very important. Why? Because everything is according to what you have today. Don't live in false idea, in false dreams on the future that, uh, that most of the times don't fulfill themselves. One day I'm going to be rich, I'm going to do that. One day I'm going to do this, I'm going to be here. We, th this is all fantasies and illusions. Let's build a big house, let's take a big mortgage, greater than what we could afford. We'll make some business, things will be okay, we'll dig it, we'll live on a loan. It is never going to happen because tomorrow your stock market can go down and the whole thing that you went went kaput and you don't have a house and you don't have money and you have nothing besides headaches. It, at best case scenario. Right now you have money to buy us so one bedroom. So you buy one bedroom. Then you don't need five bedrooms with two lions standing on top with marble and uh, I don't know what. Stones from Jerusalem. For, you don't need this. Live according to your means. Right now you're doing this. That's what you need to do. But you need to see things the right way. And I'll show you where you are wrong. And I'll finish with this. The biggest mistake that we make is in regards to learning Torah. Because you say, <clears throat> listen, Rabbi, right now I can't. I'm worrying about my future. And I have a lot of money. One day, I'm going to have a lot of money. I'm going to be rich. I'm going to sit down and learn. Let me tell you something. You're looking at things wrong. Why? Because right now, you're measuring wrong. Maybe one day you'll be rich with money, but very poor with time. Right now, you poor with money, but you're very wealthy with time. You have all your life ahead of you. Right now, your, life, your, your time is worth nothing. At best, minimum wage. So this is the time now that you have to... You, now I'm asking you to bring the bulls of your life. Now I'm asking you to sit down and learn because you're rich. I'm measuring you according to your abilities. I'm not going to ask a person that has a full-time job, 60 years old, to sit here alone with me all day long. He can't. Because he's conditioned that he's poor. So all he's bringing me is solat milcha berulah b'shemen. A little bit farina mixed with oil. He is maybe rich with money, but poor with time. The problem is that you look at things wrong. You think you're poor and you're rich. Sometimes you think you're rich and you're poor. Korbanot come to balance this whole thing out, to put everything in the right perspective, to connect between heaven and earth, to put us all on the right path, so we can find the true light inside of us, so we can be fully able to serve Hashem through internal harmony and external harmony, to bring this whole world into tremendous harmony, so we will call it appropriate to be called the Taken Olam, to fix a world, Bemalchut Shaddai, in the kingdom of Hashem. Our job is to fix the world, and we must do it in harmony. That's why the Korbanot are needed, and until we'll be able to bring them, the work of the Korbanot will be internal with the help of the Torah. The Torah will be the Mizbeach, the Korban will greet the time. And Bezat Hashem, we should bring harmony to the world. Amen. Amen. Amen.